And it's a very good thing that we have a Prime Minister whose hero is the uh, greatest Englishman who ever lived. To get Brexit done. Make America great again. No, no, no. Hello, this is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Andrew Roberts. Andrew Roberts wrote this book all about Winston Churchill. It's his biography, described uh, by 13 newspapers as undoubtedly the best single volume biography of Churchill out there. I completely agree with them. Go and buy this book. But we're going to be talking about all things Winston Churchill and Boris Johnson. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Let's start with Churchill's controversies and Churchill's mistakes. Because um, I know that today there's lots of people who might be accused of revising history to say that Churchill, he's a racist, he's an evil person. You know, especially people on the left, it seems, people might support Jeremy Corbyn would say, you know, he's even worse than Hitler um, or, you know, whatever. So let's talk about his mistakes and his biggest flaws. Well, you're right there. Can, if I can just butt in, John McDonnell actually accused him of being a villain. Uh, before the general election. Uh, the, I would argue the greatest hero in British history was accused of being a villain by, uh, by John MacDonald. We'll start breaking down those accusations um, and then we'll move on to Churchill's life proper. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Churchill's uh, sort of non-supportiveness towards the women's suffrage movement um, in the early days at least. Well, Why worse than that, it was, it was not so much not in supportiveness. He was opposed to it. Uh, he didn't think that uh, women should have the vote. He thought that it was, he was a liberal at the time. He thought that they were all going to vote conservative, that they were very conservative minded um, compared to men and that the liberals were therefore never going to form another government. So it wasn't because of some belief in women being uh, inferior beings or, or, you know, thicker than men. It was simply a political um, a political argument that he was making and uh, in fact in a way actually he was right because he himself benefited enormously. Women um, did skew towards the Conservatives for the rest of his career. Luckily for him of course he was a Conservative by the time uh, that they got the vote. So that's the first issue. Then let's move on to racism. I mean, think, I think this is probably the biggest issue that people have with Churchill. And obviously there's the, that old sort of saying that you can't judge people by today's standards of the past. But he did make some pretty pretty racist quotes. Yes, he did, absolutely. Uh, he believed he was, you have to remember, of course, born at the time when Charles Darwin was still alive, when uh, the idea of a hierarchy of races, with the whites obviously at the top, uh, was a um, scientific fact. That's how it was considered at the time. We know it to be uh, obscene and absurd, but at the time they thought it was a scientific fact. And uh, Churchill, I'm afraid, um, was not a um, radical scientist, he wasn't able to see into the future and he did believe in that, uh, in that hierarchy of races. But I think it's very important to point out, of course, that what he got from that, what he took away from that um, belief in the hierarchy of races was the absolute duty of the British Empire to take care of the natives of the British Empire uh, of all colours. And so you see again and again his profound belief that uh, it gave a great deal of responsibility to the whites in the British Empire to ensure that they brought to the highest possible stage of development everyone in the empire. So it was a completely different form of racism than the racism of someone, say, like Adolf Hitler, who thought that being at the top of the racial tree gave him the right to um, oppress and, and destroy and ultimately, in many cases, to kill people in races that he thought of as inferior. I think we'll, we'll move on to his character in a moment. I just want to go through, those are a couple of sort of character flaws perhaps, and we'll talk about his, his strengths in a minute. Well, I don't think they are character flaws really, I, because actually uh, you can't expect people to live outside their own time. Uh, it's, it's just, it's too much. You might as well ask what Oliver Cromwell thought of socialised medicine. <laughs> you know, unless you see people, as an historian I see this the whole time, unless you see people in their own time, uh, then you can't understand them, and it can't be held as a character flaw or for somebody not to be able to th see what people think a hundred years in the future. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the mistakes that he made, not necessarily about his character, but these are sort of material mistakes that we can look back on now and say, well, there were even people at the time saying that that was a big mistake. And I mean, the biggest of that was, was Gallipoli. Um, how did 
can you just explain to people what actually happened at Gallipoli, how much influence Churchill had on that decision um, for the British to go in, and what kind of effect it had on his mentality, on his way of sort of looking at life? Yes, well, and not just the British, of course. The, uh, the French were a huge part of Gallipoli, the Australians, New Zealanders. It was a, a real international force that, uh, that landed. Um, it was a brilliant idea. The concept of Gallipoli, this is what makes it so, so um, controversial in a sense and also so difficult to understand um, why they stayed there for so long, because it was a brilliant idea. If you could bring the Royal Navy from the eastern Mediterranean through the Straits of the Dardanelles and to then anchor it off Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, and then through the threat of shelling, take the Ottoman Empire, take the Turkish Empire out of the First World War, it would have been one of the greatest strategic coups in the history of warfare. And what happened, of course, was on the, and Churchill, it was his idea, and he was 100% behind it. Um, but he wasn't responsible for what happened on the 18th of March 1915, which was we, trying to get through the Straits, lost six ships to Turkish mines, which we didn't know were there. And, um, and then what they did five weeks later on the 25th of April 1915 was to land what was at that time the largest amphibious force in the history of warfare, uh, up until D-Day it was. And, uh, and it, was a, it was tragic. When you go to see those battlefields and you look up the 45 degree angles that the men had to charge up uh, with perfect Turkish uh, fields of machine gun fire uh, in the most terrible circumstances, especially in the summer, um, it, uh, it was understandable how they managed to lose quite so many men. And over the next eight months, they lost no fewer than 147,000 killed and wounded. What effect did that have on Churchill's mentality afterwards? Well, he learned from his mistakes. Uh, this is the great thing about Churchill. Um, he doesn't, there's, a, there's no mistake that he doesn't make in his career that he doesn't learn from. And what he learned from this disaster at Gallipoli, which he was reminded of constantly because people would shout, hecklers would shout at his public meetings, uh, what about the Dardanelles, right the way up through the 1920s into the 1930s. And what he learned from the Dardanelles was never to... Um, countermand the chiefs of staff during the Second World War. So you have the situation where all three of the chiefs of staff in the Second World War agreed on something. Churchill then never overruled them in the way that he had overruled the Admiralty at the time of the Dardanelles. That really goes to his character, doesn't it? And I want to talk a bit about his character, as I said, in a minute. He also supported the gold standard when he was Chancellor. Um, can you talk about how that affected Britain? And again, that, it was a huge mistake at the time, but Churchill learned from it. Yes, that's right. Uh, the gold standard was the, um, was the way in which you could um, exchange pound, paper pounds for it, their equivalent in gold, which meant that you couldn't reflate the economy when, uh, when times were bad. And times were bad, of course. We went on to the gold standard in 1925. Um, and uh, times were very bad very shortly after that, after the Americans' um, uh, Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, which came as a result of that. And we weren't able to adjust because of the gold standard. Um, I think it's worth pointing out, by the way, that it wasn't just Churchill who was in favour of that. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer, but the Bank of England wanted to join the gold standard, the Treasury wanted to, the Labour Party, Conservative Party and Liberal Party all wanted to join the gold standard. Uh, it had been public policy for all the parties for years. It's just that he happened to be the, uh, the person who, um, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time that uh, we had an opportunity to do it. Uh, so yes, that was a, a, one of his blunders, one of his many blunders. One of the things about um, writing a book about Churchill is that you do come across lots of blunders. You've chosen to start with three or four of them. I mean, we could also talk about the black and tans in Ireland. We could talk about the abdication crisis when he, of course, supported King Edward VIII, later Duke of Windsor, over uh, King George VI, his brother. Uh, there are any number of mistakes. But as I say, the great thing about Churchill is that he learnt from all of them. And what he learnt from the um, from the uh, banking crisis and the gold standard was to, certainly in the Second World War and afterwards, to keep the economy as nimble as possible, not get it attached to anything in particular, not even the uh, American dollar, but to, um, uh, one hesitates to use the phrase, but take back control of one's own um, economic destiny.
Let's talk about his character. What was the Churchill ethos? What were the things that made him Churchill that he learned all over those years? What part of his, what were his values? Uh, I think the first thing that one has to understand about Churchill in order to appreciate him um, at all is his extraordinary sense of destiny. Um, when he was only a 16 year old schoolboy at Harrow, he said to his best friend, um, there should be terrible upheavals and great struggles in our lives and I shall be called upon to save London, save England and save the Empire. And he said that at 16 years old and then of course half a century later that's exactly what he was doing. Um, and these, uh, this sense of destiny came as a result of an incredibly large number of close brushes with death that Churchill had. He was um, born prematurely, two months prematurely, which in Victorian England, of course, is itself a close brush with death. He had a um, school friend stab him in the stomach, well, clearly not a very close friend, <laughs> stab him in the stomach at the age of 10. He nearly died of pneumonia at the age of 12. He nearly died in a house fire, in a drowning, um, very nearly drowned on Lake Lausanne when he was uh, 17 years old. And that he was involved in two plane crashes, three car crashes, and it's the most extraordinary series of, of events. And those are only the peacetime close brushes with death. He also, of course, fought in five campaigns on four continents. At one point he wrote that there's nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without result. And Churchill was shot at without result a great deal in his life. And what he took from all of this was that he would be specially chosen to try to save, save London and save England. Do you know what I love about this book so much is that it is critical of him and it does show his flaws and it does show the mistakes that he's made. Um, but then you get a whole rounded sense of a human being, of Churchill, and I think that adds to his character. Well, that's kind of you. Thank you. Um, there's no point in writing a hagiography. First of all, loads of them have already been written before, things where Churchill has, n has no flaws, no errors. Equally, uh, I would be just as bored trying to write a, a knocking biography, where a revisionist biography where he didn't get anything right and, and that he was a monster throughout his life and there are lots of those as well. No, the reason that uh, this book has, uh, has done as well as it has and um, I think is because uh, it tries to be even-handed about him um, with an I suppose an underlying, I, I could never get away from an underlying admiration for the, for the, um, the great man. Uh, he was undoubtedly a great man, but I don't try for a moment to hide his, uh, his flaws, and neither did he. And th you see, this is one of the interesting things about Churchill, is he appreciated he had these flaws. He, he spoke about them in public. He was not one of those politicians who pretended that he got everything right all his life. Um, and he also uh, said that actually, he writes to his wife Clementine uh, from the trenches in 1916 because he'd been forced to, to, to um, leave the Admiralty that he loved because of the Dardanelles crisis. And, uh, and he writes from the trenches and says to his wife in January 1916, I should have made nothing if I had not made mistakes. So he appreciated that about himself. Now, when reading this book, I jotted down a couple of things that I thought was part of Churchill's ethos, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, um, and I'd, I'd be, love for you to go through a couple of the, the things that I've, that I've written down. Now, you've already mentioned a few of them, so honour, I think, is a huge part of his life. Uh, that, that sort of sense of defending the British Empire, again, is a huge part of his, his values. All those flaws and then learning from those flaws, again, part of the Churchill, Churchill ethos. And the other thing that I really love about Churchill is how emotional he is. I mean, you yes. know, you go and see him crying in public. You'd never see a politician do that today. Um, we'll talk about later um, comparing Boris's, uh, Boris Johnson, the current Prime Minister's um, ethos with Churchill's. But can you just focus in on a few of those points? Yes, well, that's very true. He wasn't. Um, what became very clear to me when I was writing this book was he was not the buttoned up Victorian aristocrat of his age and class and background. Uh, he was, with the stiff upper lip, refusing to show any emotion in public. Uh, he actually burst into tears no fewer than 50 times. Uh, and those are just the ones that I was able to, um, to uh, add up. Um, and uh, a lot of things would make him cry. I knew his private secretary, his last private secretary, uh, Sir Anthony Montague Brown, quite well. And Anthony once said to me, yes, uh, he um, told, Churchill told Anthony, I blub easily, you know, he said. Um, and, uh, and I said, well, what would set him off? And he said, pretty much anything. Uh, certainly weddings and funerals, he'd cry. Um, any story of heroism would have him in tears. He said, even the tale of a noble dog struggling struggling through the snow to his master. That kind of thing would make him cry as well. And the reason, I think, that he was not the normal 
uh, Victorian aristocrat was because he was a throwback to an earlier era. He was an, actually a Regency aristocrat. In those days, people did cry. Every single one of the uh, admirals at St Paul's Cathedral, just over there, um, every single one of the ones who were carrying Nelson's coffin in January 1806 were in tears. You split the book into two sections, the preparation and the trial. Now, we've mentioned a couple of the things that perhaps... Can I explain why? Uh, absolutely. Just because it's part of the quotation. Um, and it also fits in very much with what we were talking about earlier about uh, Churchill's sense of destiny, because on the day he became Prime Minister, on the 10th of May, um, 1940 and it was an extraordinary day because that morning Adolf Hitler had unleashed blitzkrieg on the west invading Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg shortly afterwards also of course to invade France and what he said was in the um, in his autobiography in his war memoirs the last paragraph of the first volume the gathering storm was I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial and so I've had the uh, first part of the book called The Preparation, where he is, he's tested, but he holds the great offices of state, like Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer and First Lord of the Admiralty in both the First World War and the Second World War. And then there's the trial, um, the trial of 1940, the appalling dangers that we faced as a nation at the time of the Blitz and the Battle of Britain, um, and uh, the way in which he was able to use uh, everything he'd learned from his past life and put it into practice, saving the country and ultimately, of course, saving the world. Let's talk about the preparation and then we'll go on to the trial um, in a minute. So, again, we've talked about the character flaws, we've talked about the things that have made Churchill Churchill, and that, again, that made him so successful in the trial in the Second World War. Um, let's focus in on a couple other events that happened. I know he's got a huge ego, Churchill, massive, massive ego. Um, and I know that you say that helped him win World War II. Where did his ego come from? Where did this sense of destiny and ego come from? Well, the de destiny, as we mentioned earlier, com comes largely, I think, from these close brushes with death that, uh, that he survives and therefore he thinks he's specially chosen uh, to survive. He wasn't a Christian in any real sense. Uh, he used to joke that he was a bit like the flying buttress in that he supported the church, but from the outside. Um, he had instead a, a sense of, of himself. Uh, where did it come from? I think partly, of course, there was just a massive sense of entitlement. He was the grandson of a duke. He was born in a palace, uh, not just any old palace, but Blenheim Palace, a palace that even the royals envy. Uh, so he was descended from uh, the great Duke of Marlborough, the first Duke of Marlborough, who, um, who saved Britain during the wars of uh, Spanish succession at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, so all of that, plus the leadership that he was taught um, at Sandhurst as a young officer in the British Army, he fought, as I said, in uh, five wars, and so he had his own sense of, um, of command. Uh, he also, uh, he, so he knew he was a good leader. He'd also shown incredible bravery, not just on battlefields, but also when he escaped from a prisoner of war camp in South Africa uh, in uh, the Boer War, which made him an international celebrity. So you have in this, uh, in this man who's, I'm sure we'll be talking about his parents in a moment, but his father was one of the great Victorian politicians of his day. So he very much wanted to emulate his, uh, his father as well, especially after his father died young. Uh, so you have in Churchill all of these advantages and the other classic advantage, which was that he didn't have very much money. Um, his uh, parents were spendthrifts. Every penny he, he, pretty much every penny that he could ever uh, spend was stuff that he had to make himself. So he became the highest paid war correspondent in the world. And that allowed him to, um, to go into politics. And uh, he wouldn't have chosen that unless he was a naturally brave figure as well. So he had all the, the natural advantages and also the key disadvantage that you really do need, which is to be um, not rich enough to just um, sit on his backside all his life. It's funny you say that because I know uh, one of the other great leaders of uh, the 20th century, Margaret Thatcher, she used to say, you need two great advantages in life, no money and good parents. Um, but the, <laughs> and the funny thing well, about Churchill is that, as you, and you guessed yeah, my question. Terrible parents. You guessed my question yes. exactly. Um, you know, what were his parents like? He had an absolutely awful childhood. He had a terrible childhood because um, 
Uh, his father, who I mentioned earlier, Lord Randolph Churchill, this great Victorian um, politician, despised him, saw no m spirit, no spark at all in Winston Churchill, his, uh, his son, and had contempt for him, wrote him letters that are in this book that no father should ever write to any son, uh, full of disdain and contempt. And yet, when his father died at the age of 45, when Churchill was 20 in 1895, he um, sought out his father's friends, he wrote his father's large thousand page two two volume biography he wrote um to all his father's friends to to, to try and see them but he adopted his father's political stance the tory um the tory democracy stance of benjamin disraeli uh, he adopted his father's speaking style he um called his own son randolph after his father so he continued to love and admire and respect and attempt to be like his father even though his father had had no respect for him um, and you get this extraordinary moment in 1947 when, after the Second World War, so, uh, therefore, when he believed he met his father's ghost. And he had a long conversation with his father's ghost, and at no point in this conversation did he ever let on that he had been instrumental in helping win the Second World War. Uh, so in a sense, Churchill is spending his whole life attempting to impress the shade of his long-dead father. And with regard to his mother, Jenny Jerome, an American, of course, born in Brooklyn, uh, she was a great high society beauty. Uh, she was having affairs with the Prince of Wales and the Austrian ambassador and so on. And she, she married twice, both times people of Churchill's own age. And she just had no time for for Winston or his younger brother Jack. There's a, in the first six months, for example, in the year 1884, when Churchill was nine years old, he only um, saw his mother for six and a half hours of those six months. And yet again, when his, his mother um, uh, died, when he, he was writing his uh, great autobiography, My Early Life, a wonderful book, which I recommend you read immediately as, after you finish mine, um, <laughs> What um, he said was, she shone for me like the evening star, brilliant, but at a distance. And uh, that's an incredibly sad thing for any, for any son to have to say about one's mother. I mean, there's a, there's a tragic letter that he wrote, when, was he eight or nine or something at the time, saying, Mummy, can you come and visit me? And she didn't even reply, right? That's right, yes, and that happened again and again. And, and he said, please, 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 didn't he? I and mean, he says sort of nine pleases in a row, please uh, come and, and visit me. And she never did. Uh, the only time they get, that uh, the parents went to visit um, uh, Winston at school was um, when he was nearly dying of pneumonia. Uh, he had been sadistically and viciously beaten by his headmaster, who, who took great pleasure from sadistically hurting small children. And, uh, and it was only because of his beloved nanny, Elizabeth Everest, uh, seeing these terrible scars and whelks on, whelps on his back side, uh, that he was taken away from the school that mother would never have noticed otherwise. Because he, did, he didn't have a great time at Harrow as well, did he? Not really, but actually, funny enough, worse than, than uh, sorry, not as bad as he made out in his autobiography. He was actually a lot brighter than he made out in his, uh, in his book. Uh, he, when, you get, when you actually look at his school reports, he was in the top third of the class for everything, especially English and history, but also for other things like Latin, which he pretended that he was incredibly bad at. And this also makes him very unusual as a politician, because, of course, how many politicians ever make themselves out to be thicker than they genuinely are. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing that most uh, politicians or statesmen ever do. But, but Churchill did. He was, for example, um, the um, fencing champion for, for the public schools, the whole national uh, English public schools. He, uh, he, he flung himself into every area of the school. He wasn't uh, anything like the, um, uh, the sort of, you know, bullied, um, Dimmy Dumbo that he made himself out to be. So in this preparation, we, let's give people a bit of context up to the 1930s when Hitler comes to power and then obviously into World War II. So Churchill has gone through all these terrible mistakes we've talked about. He's got a huge ambition, a massive ego, but also massively great qualities as well, learning from all these mistakes. Um, and we get to the 1930s and Churchill, for, for, he'd been in government for a very long time, he'd been an MP for a very long time, but he finds himself 
in the wilderness years, um, where he's basically not in government anymore, and he's a dissenter. He's from the outside um, looking in, sort of criticising the government and over appeasement. So can you give people a bit of sense of um, where Churchill's at in the early 1930s, and then we'll go on to why his warnings about appeasement fail. Yes, well, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1924 through the general strike of 1926, which he was very much involved in, uh, through up till 1929, uh, when the government lost, the the Conservatives lost the general election um, uh, to the Labour Party. And so he was out of office anyway. But then he resigned from the Shadow Cabinet over the uh, Shadow Cabinet, the Tory party's decision to give self-government to India, which he was opposed to. He believed that... uh, that India wasn't ready for self-government. He thought that the princes of India, who he thought were a stable pro-British force, would be um, stripped of their powers. He thought that there would be terrible communal violence between the Muslims and the Hindus, and indeed the Sikhs up in the Punjab and the northwest frontier province. Um, And he thought the untouchables were also going to get a pretty terrible time if uh, India was ruled by the majority Hindu um, Uh, Hindu majority. So he was opposed to it and he resigned so he was out and when the Conservatives came back into government in 1931 they didn't bring Churchill and Churchill was not called upon either after the 1935 general election so he basically stayed out of Um, of government from 1929 all the way through to the moment when Neville Chamberlain um, made him Prime Minister, sorry, made him First Lord of the Admiralty on the day the Second World War broke out on the 3rd of September 1939. So he was out for a decade and he used that time extremely um, intelligently. He wrote lots of books. I mentioned earlier about how broke he was all the way through his life and uh, and this forced him to write books which is very helpful for a biographer like me because you can get into the mind of the man that way. Um, But he also also uh, commented on every great um, issue. He made many thousands of speeches. The actual uh, the, the collection of his speeches covers like eight thousand pages, um, and so he used that time to hone his oratorical ability. And he spotted in Adolf Hitler. Uh, He was not only the first major British politician, but actually the only major British politician, uh, really, to to see what Hitler and the Nazis were all about and to have the bravery to to say it. And people didn't want to listen to him. Uh, The First World War had been horrific, obviously, and appeasement was very popular. They didn't want to listen to him, but he forced them to by the extraordinary eloquence of his of his uh, oratory. And when you look at, I go into this book in, in, in some detail about the tricks of the trade, as it were, the, his own views on rhetoric and how to create a public speech that can force people to listen to you if they don't agree with you and don't want to listen to you. So Churchill had been making these warnings about Hitler and the Nazis, and you, as you say, he's a, he's a lone wolf almost in British politics. What was it about Hitler that Churchill recognised immediately that was so negative? Well, I think you're right, and in fact he was making um, uh, warnings about Hitler even before Hitler came to power. Um, and uh, I think it was really three things. The first was that Hit- uh, that um, Winston Churchill was a philo semite He liked Jews. He'd grown up with Jews. His father had liked Jews. He'd been on holiday with them. He appreciated the contribution that Jews make to the human race and to uh, Western civilization. And so, and he was a Zionist at the time of the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and so on. So he had an early warning system when it came to Hitler and the Nazis that a lot of the other people in politics, uh, the anti-Semites in the House of Commons on both sides of the aisle, did not have. The second thing was that he was an historian. And um, one of the reasons I'm proud to be an historian was that Churchill was one. He was able to place Hitler in the long panoply of British history, uh, the long, uh, n- huge number of attacks on British sovereignty and independence. Um, from Philip II of Spain and the Spanish Armada, and then Louis XIV of France at the time of the Wars of Spanish Succession, which of course his own great ancestor helped win, the Duke of Marlborough helped, uh, helped win, then the, pe- the threat uh, posed by Napoleon, after that Louis XIV, sorry, um, Kaiser Wilhelm in the First World War against whom he'd of course fought in the trenches, and then Hitler. So he saw that in the long continuum of British history. And uh, the third thing was that he had been up against fanaticism um, 
himself up on the northwest frontier and in the Sudan Islamic fundamentalist um, fanaticism, which he saw the same tropes in the political fanaticism of the Nazis, in a way that the other prime ministers of the 1930s, men like Stanley Baldwin and uh, Ramsay MacDonald and Neville Chamberlain, couldn't do because they'd never come up against that kind of fanaticism before. And so Churchill, because of the preparation of his earlier life, was able to make this absolutely vital uh, spotting of Hitler as early as he did. He was a historian. He was also a journalist, so I'll, I'll take that <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> he was indeed. He earned, he earned more money being a journalist than well, he did being a historian. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, you talk about his preparation um, being a fantastic uh, resource for him in that sense because he realises Hitler is, is such a bad person. But it's also a drag on him in, in one way that he makes all these speeches, he makes all these uh, warnings, but no one listens to him. I know, and heartbreaking for him, uh, because he knew he was right. He knew that the world was hurtling towards disaster. He knew that uh, the West should stand up to Hitler as early as possible, should not let him take uh, the Rhineland and Austria and um, the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And it wasn't until Hitler actually marched into Prague in March 1939 that people recognised that Churchill had been right all along. And that was the point at which people started to, to listen to him properly and to realise how vital it was to, uh, to rearm, of course, especially in the air. Um, we see the city here behind us, that uh, one of the many cities in, in uh, Britain that got so badly knocked about in the Blitz. Well, that wouldn't have happened if we had uh, heeded Churchill early enough and had a massive Royal Air Force um, capable of, of taking on the Luftwaffe from day one. It's funny that his flaws can also flip into his best, best personality, uh, bits of his personality. For example, his great oratory. Um, he would make these fantastic speeches about how Churchill, uh, how, how Hitler rather, um, was such a dangerous person. Um, but people simply thought he was exaggerating because he always made these fantastic emotional speeches about every topic that, and some of which he'd got wrong in the past. And then he becomes prime minister in 1940. Talk to me about his qualities as Prime Minister when he first becomes Prime Minister, including those great speeches. Well, that's right. I mean, many of the things, because he wasn't much of a party man, he had um, started off in the Tory party, gone over to the Liberal Party for 20 years, gone back to the Tory party. Um, that was always held against him. Um, as, he, as he said, uh, um, anyone can rat, but it takes a certain ingenuity to re-rat. And, uh, but the great thing about that in 1940 was that you needed somebody who was above party, who was not a party man, who was able to bring the whole nation together in a national coalition to fight Hitler. So that was one of his weaknesses that became a strength. Another was his sheer obstinacy. You know, he was a very obstinate man. And yet in 1940 we needed obstinacy. Uh, we needed somebody who was going to be able to say, no, we will not make peace with Adolf Hitler. Um, he, a proper leader who uh, was not following the opinion polls all the time. He didn't take any notice of opinion polls. There's a marvellous <laughs> remark in the Second World War uh, when he was told that politicians should listen to opinion polls. He said that he didn't believe that, uh, actually one of the Labour MPs had said, they need to keep their ears to the ground. And Churchill said that he didn't think that the British people would respect a politician caught in so ungainly a posture. <laughs> so that's real leadership as well. Um, the foresight he showed, not just before the Second World War, but also he'd shown it before the First World War, warning against uh, the Kaiser and the build-up of the German Navy. And then, of course, after the Second World War, at the time of his great speech of uh, the Iron Curtain speech at Fulton, Missouri, in March 1946, when he warned against Stalin and the dangers posed uh, by Soviet communism to Eastern Europe. So you have this, this foresight, this extraordinary um, moral courage to continue to say things that were very unpopular. He was shouted down in the House of Commons at one point. He was um, lambasted in the press. He was ridiculed. Um, the Conservatives nearly took his seat away, deselected him for his seat in Parliament. Um, and yet he didn't change a word of his warnings. Um, and that showed a moral courage that was equal to his physical courage. And you have all these things together so that by the time he becomes Prime Minister in May 1940, he is in a prime position to speak to a nation that is willing to listen and actually to tell them that they're going to win, even though two weeks after he became Prime Minister, there was the devastating blow of the retreat from Dunkirk. And 
Uh, so he, which wasn't blamed on him any more than any of the other earlier defeats were blamed on him because he had been warning that we needed to rearm earlier and, and stronger. But nonetheless, um, he was able in that summer of 1940 to tell the British people that they were going to be on the winning side in the Second World War, even though America wasn't in the war, Russia was on the side of the Germans. The Germans were about to um, crush the French and, uh, and, and capture Paris on the 17th of June uh, 1940. So you have this extraordinary um, feeling of goodwill towards Churchill by the British people. He was running at 80, sometimes 90 percent in the polls, approval ratings in the polls, that have never been seen by any politician before or since. I think you paint a fantastic picture of there, Britain, 1940. We're standing alone, we're getting bombed by Germany, America isn't helping us, we're in a, such a disastrous position militarily, and yet he still manages to get that, that kind of uh, hope from the British people. And to any normal person, to any regular human being, being Prime Minister in 1940 would get you down a bit, probably. <laughs> um, it, you, know, you probably wouldn't be the happiest person in the world, seeing as you've probably got one of the diffi most difficult jobs in history. Um, but there's this myth about Churchill that he got depressed, and there's this myth about him, or I don't know if it is myth, you can explain to people if it is or not, um, about the, the black dog. Can you just, can you explain to people yes, about yes, that? Yes, absolutely. But before I do, the, yeah. the phrase stand alone, I think we've got to unpack that slightly, of course, because it's very important to remember that the Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, yes. uh, India, the, the, the Empire and Commonwealth all declared war at the same time as we did in uh, September 1939. So we were alone in terms of this island. However, we did have beyond the seas a, uh, a fantastic um, and huge empire that uh, was in the struggle. Um, and actually, the, at the time of the, of the retreat from Dunkirk, the only um, fully armoured um, and fully equipped unit in the whole of the United Kingdom between the White Cliffs of Dover and this city of London was the Canadian First Division. So ultimately, if the Germans had just come straight over, it would have been the Canadians that would have been defending London. Um, but with regard to his depression, it's uh, a myth. He wasn't a depressive. Depression is a debilitating illness, and yet he was able to chair over 900 meetings of the, um, of the Defence Committee of the War Cabinet during the Second World War. He uh, only uses the phrase black dog once in his whole life, and that is um, in 1911, July 1911, writing to his wife Clementine at a time actually when the phrase was used by Edwardian matrons and governesses to explain their bad-tempered children. Um, he was uh, not, therefore, subject to um, a sort of clinical illness at all. He got depressed, undoubtedly. He got depressed at the time of the fall of Singapore in February 1942, the time of um, the fall of Tobruk in June 1942. He was depressed for much of the um, Gallipoli campaign that we spoke about earlier. But those are moments when any sentient decision maker would have got depressed. Anyone would have. Um, he didn't suddenly get depressed for no reason, which is what manic depression is, uh, is all about. Um, neither, by the way, was he uh, um, an alcoholic. This is another great myth. He did drink an enormous amount. There's no doubt about that. He was capable of drinking an incredible amount. He had an absolute iron constitution for alcohol. Um, one of his uh, friends, C.P. Scott, the journalist, uh, in fact, said uh, that Winston Churchill couldn't have been an alcoholic because no alcoholic could have drunk that much, <laughs> which, uh, which, is, which is true. He, he was uh, somebody who could just ingest enormous amounts of, uh, of alcohol. But there is no day in the full 2,148 days of the Second World War, there is only one day, uh, the 7th of March 1944, when he was, the people around him said, the Prime Minister is drunk. And on that occasion, he'd been drinking from six o'clock in the evening till the meeting ended at about three o'clock in the morning. And, uh, he, and he was drunk, and what they decided to do was to hold the same meeting the next day, the next morning, as though the last one hadn't happened. And uh, so there's no decision that was taken during the Second World War um, when the Prime Minister was drunk, which is an extraordinary thing when you think of the incredible strains and stresses on that man, strains and stresses that hopefully we'll never come anywhere near n noticing in, in our lives. And, uh, and yet he, uh, he didn't succumb. 
Now, if viewers want to find out more about what happened in World War II with Churchill, then they can read the book. Um, but I want to get on to uh, comparisons of Boris Johnson and Winston Churchill. Now, obviously, Boris wrote his own book about Churchill, um, and then we'll finally get on to quotations at the very end. Um, so, how does Boris compare to Churchill as a character, as a man? Golly, uh, that's a good question. Well. First of all, I think it's a very good thing that um, Boris Johnson's hero is Winston Churchill. Uh, he, as you say, wrote that book, a great best-selling uh, book on that, uh, where he was attempting to bring an entire new uh, generation, new audience to Churchill. And uh, that's a very good thing to do. Um, He's somebody who, who uh, loves and admires Churchill, uh, who appreciates the the negative sides and the and the blunders and so on um, but also somebody who a bit like Churchill is able to use humor and in a devastating way to ridicule his enemies of course as Churchill did um, but also to change the subject sometimes which is quite a clever thing for a politician to do but also just to jolly along a nation that uh, in uh, in, certainly in wartime, of course, with, with, with uh, Winston Churchill, but also in this last three and a half years since, uh, since the Brexit um, referendum and the way in which the establishment tried to subvert the democratically expressed will of the British people for three and a half years, uh, Boris has managed to, to cheer us up um, from even that as well. So I think it's very important not to um, mistake um, the two men, obviously. Winston Churchill only became Prime Minister in a world war. It would have taken uh, it did take a world war for him to become Prime Minister. He wouldn't have become Prime Minister under any less circumstance than that because he was so distrusted because of all of those blunders that we mentioned earlier. And thank God we're nowhere near anything like that. Um, but, uh, but Boris Johnson also came to um, power in a political crisis, a very significant, I would say existential uh, political crisis when it comes to the identity of Britain, um, self-identity of Britain. So there are, there are overlaps and it's a very good thing that we have a Prime Minister whose hero is the uh, greatest Englishman who ever lived. Do you think we've seen Boris's finest hour just yet? No, 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 no. I think he's going to be in power for 10 years and there are going to be, there are going to be huge numbers of um, fine hours. Um, I, uh, I, I, I was um, uh, really so impressed, am so impressed, by the way in which he has uh, grown into the role. He obviously enjoys being Prime Minister, which Churchill uh, did as well. And um, I think he, he could, I mean, he's already done the most important thing in bring, bringing Britain out of the European Union, but there's so much more to do. And it strikes me that he's got that sense of um, optimism that Churchill was able to, uh, to um, show as well. And uh, I, think, um, I think there's a chance that he could be the greatest Prime Minister since Margaret Thatcher. Part of my job as a journalist is obviously to read the news and I look, look at the news cycle at the same time. And as I've been reading this book over the last few weeks, um, I've been sort of maybe seeing a few Churchillian moments in, in Boris. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. HS2, I mean, hugely unpopular, I would say, in the country and among you know, vast amounts of our sort of political um, class, uh, Boris has decided to, to go ahead with it. Uh, same with Huawei, that decision he made about the sort of letting China um, invest in our infrastructure, hugely, probably hugely unpopular, I'd say, in the country. But again, um, that didn't sway Boris to choose. And you know, viewers probably might disagree with Boris on those two things. Maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But he was obviously I making certainly that. disagree with him on one of those two Well, there you things. go. And, he's, and he's, <laughs> he's making decisions that some would see as, as, as unpopular yeah. as he becomes prime minister. And the other one uh, that I but thought was... But to govern is to choose. Right, exactly. Um, and, uh, and unless you're able to make uh, decisions, I mean, this I think was one of the drawbacks. I'm, I'm afraid with Mrs. May is that decisions obviously uh, caught her like a rabbit in the headlights. Um, in the end, you want a prime minister who is going to come down and say yes or no, even if you don't necessarily agree every time with the decision that's been made. And Churchill always always said, um, am, am I correct, in that uh, you know, public opinion is not the most important thing, it's getting it right and making those decisions not for the public but because it's the right thing to do and he's always did that. Absolutely right.
The other um, big comparison I saw recently was Boris made this fantastic speech, I think one of, probably one of the best speeches he's, he's ever made as a politician, um, about free trade. I'm not sure if you saw at this. Greenwich. Um, at Greenwich. Yeah. And he was sort of li uh, championing, championing free trade, saying Britain should be a global leader in free trade. That's something that Churchill has always said as well. Well, of course it was over free trade that Churchill uh, resigned in 1904 from the Conservative Party because they were adopting protectionism. And um, it was only when they went back to the free trade principles in 1924 that he was able to return to the Conservative Party. And so, yes, uh, it was a classic example. I know that whenever politicians ever leave their party, they always say, it's my party leaving me rather than me leaving the party. But that was true when it came to Churchill and free trade. And uh, so, yes, there's something, there's something Churchillian in, in Boris's stance on free trade, certainly. And perhaps one difference, or you may call it a similarity, is that um, Boris, I mean, I, my personal view of Boris is that he isn't necessarily, he hasn't necessarily got those core principles as a politician might do as Churchill does. Um, I think that he hasn't necessarily always been consistent in his beliefs, but then again, Churchill switched parties, he, he changed his mind. So what do you think about that? Is, does Boris have the same core principles as Churchill did? Do you know, I think he does, um, because he's of the same political view as Churchill. It's, t it's called Tory democracy. It can, um, it's, it's, um, Antecedents go back to uh, Benjamin Disraeli, to um, Churchill's own father, Lord Randolph, and then it comes down through Churchill and Harold Macmillan to, um, uh, well, ultimately now to Boris Johnson. He's very much on the liberal wing of the Conservative Party. I'm not myself, I'm a Thatcherite Conservative, but I do recognise that, apart from Margaret Thatcher, it tends to be the case that, um, that Tory leaders are, uh, are Tory Democrats. And if Churchill um, and, uh, and Boris Johnson win um, elections, win as many elections as Margaret Thatcher did, then I'm happy. Now, this book, it's the 1,010th uh, biography of Churchill. Um, but what makes it different? Why should anyone go out and read this book and not the other? Or maybe Boris Johnson's? <laughs> oh, well, no, do read Boris's. Uh, it's a very good book. But um, uh, my book is different really because it had access to sources that no other book has had, including Boris's in fact. Um, the Queen allowed me to be uh, the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diaries and King George VI met Churchill every Tuesday of the Second World War. They had lunch together at Buckingham Palace in an audience. They served it themselves from the side tables because they couldn't have anybody else in the room because what they were discussing was um, every important issue of the Second World War and uh, the um, Prime Minister trusted the King with the nuclear secret, the ultra decrypts secret, which countries were going to be invaded, which ministers and uh, admirals and generals were going to be hired and fired and so on. And the King wrote everything down. And so uh, that's been an extraordinary new source. But also there have been 41 sets of papers that have been deposited at Churchill College, Cambridge since the um, last major biography of Churchill, which I've been able to use, including Churchill's daughter's wartime diaries and so on. Uh, in uh, Moscow, the papers of the diaries of the Soviet ambassador, Ivan Maisky, uh, became available in time for me to be able to use them. And uh, he met Churchill an awful lot, especially, of course, during the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, the Churchill family have been tremendously helpful to me. They've allowed me to use, for example, Pamela Harriman's love letters, uh, the love letters of, uh, uh, of the lady who was married to Churchill's son during the Second World War, but also had um, affairs with <laughs> a huge number of uh, of very prominent people. Um, I've been able to uh, myself discover the verbatim accounts of the War Cabinet and so we know what every individual War Cabinet member said during the uh, War Cabinet meetings and this is the first book that makes use of that as well. So um, it hasn't surprised me the um, the popularity of this, uh, of this book and the prizes it's won and things like that because it does use an absolute avalanche of new sources. Well, as I say, I can't recommend reading this book enough to the audience. I mean, it's one of those books where on one page you laugh and one page you're crying. And um, 
I want to fi finish the interview by reading my favourite quote from the book, and then I want to know what your favourite quote is as well. So this is from Winston Churchill, who was, as, as we, we talked about his character of being, you know, he makes those mistakes, he, he gets himself back up again, and he's got this extraordinary determination in life. And I think this quote really goes down to that, and hopefully people listening will, will sort of get it um, from, from me reading it. You and this, he's talking to the young men of people before, before World War II. He says, you are needed now more than ever to fill the gap of a generation shorn by the war. You not, have not an hour to lose. You must take your places in life's fighting line. 20 to 25, these are the years. Don't be content with how things are. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof. Enter upon your inheritance, accept your responsibilities. Don't take no for an answer. Never submit to failure. Don't be fobbed off with mere personal success or acceptance. You will make all kinds of mistakes, but as long as you are generous and true and also fierce, you cannot hurt the world or even seriously distress her. She may be rude and won by youth. She has lived and only thrived by repeated subjugations. Uh, what's your favourite quote from Winston um, Churchill? That one's a wonderful one. In fact, I read it to my... Um uh, to my 22-year-old son just the other day, um, and uh, I'd keep my fingers crossed he, was <laughs> he took <laughs> it seriously and listening, <laughs> exactly. He seemed to. My, my favourite quotation um, comes from that terrible moment um, in November 1940 when the, we were still being blitzed on a nightly basis. Uh, all, of the, um, all of the stained glass windows of... Westminster Abbey had to be taken away um, and uh, preserved outside London. And so they boarded up the, uh, the uh, windows of Westminster Abbey. And so when Neville Chamberlain's funeral took place, it was freezing cold. Everyone was in their overcoats. And Churchill went up to the, uh, went up to the lectern and gave a short speech about political reputation, which of course in Neville Chamberlain's case had been very, very high and then was very, very low by the time he died. Um, Churchill's himself, of course, had been very low and now was, was incredibly high. And, uh, and he said this, which is about history and also about, about uh, moral vigor and, uh, and courage. History, with its flickering lamp, stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes, and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. What is the worth of all this? The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It's very imprudent to walk through life without this shield because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations. But with this shield, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honour. And with that, Andrew Roberts, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen.